so let me uh, welcome you to this uh, first lecture uh, for this uh, module. Uh, this module is titled uh, Structural Applications. Uh, I will be your uh, lecturer and, um, well, let me go through this. Well, we will not have to go through this uh, slide uh, and the main reason we won't have to go through that is because all uh, deliveries uh, will be uh, taking place online instead of face-to-face. Uh, -face. However, it's uh, quite useful to have because uh, there will be labs that you will be doing uh, uh, at the campus. So uh, all these instructions apply to the labs as well. Um, now it is customary, of course, to introduce ourselves. And I know that uh, many of you have not met me before actually. I joined the university relatively uh, recently, uh, actually just before the lockdown. Uh, so my name is uh, George, uh, Georgios Papavasiliou, as you can see over here. Uh, I'm uh, originally from Greece. Uh, I'm a lecturer in civil and uh, construction engineering. Uh, and as I said, I joined uh, in March, a few weeks before the initial lockdown. Um, as you can see, I have... Uh, quite a few degrees, uh, starting from my uh, bachelor's and master's in civil engineering uh, that I got from uh, Greece. Uh, I've also got a master's in uh, structural engineering, which was my first uh, specialization field, uh, if you want. Um, and uh, also, uh, I received my PhD from the University of Cyprus. Uh, my research was uh, actually combining the fields of structural and computational engineering. Uh, so you will definitely see me in uh, modules that are related to these two topics, uh, at least not only in these uh, ones, um, uh, in quite a few actually. Uh, I've also got a master's in engineering product management, which is, uh, let's say, a um, uh, minor specialization field for me as well. This is another topic I uh, wanted to investigate myself. Uh, and this actually came from my uh, involvement in the construction uh, industry. Uh, I've also got uh, well one degree and I will be finishing my last one uh, by December. Uh, both of them are in uh, teaching in uh, higher education. Um, I have a total of uh, 10 years of industrial experience. And as I said, this was actually one of the reasons why I did my uh, third master's in engineering project management. Um, uh, I'm actually I'm also a member of uh, professional bodies in Greece and Cyprus, where I also worked as a civil engineer. Um, and I'm currently uh, in the procedure to becoming a chartered engineer here as well. Um, I've got 11 years of academic experience, uh, both research and teaching uh, in uh, higher education institutions. Uh, regarding my research, uh, well, it comprises 40 articles, two books and five theses. Uh, but I want to focus on my teaching experience because this is uh, the first thing that um, uh, will actually benefit you uh, most. So I have been teaching in uh, civil, environmental, mechanical, and architectural engineering departments. Uh, in total, in three countries, five different institutions, and in two languages. Uh, I'm uh, mentioning all of that, of course, not in order to brag, but uh, in order to show you that um, I've got the experience uh, and I have uh, met with uh, students uh, from very diverse backgrounds. Uh, so I really want to offer you the best experience in uh, this module as well. At any point, if you have any questions or any concerns, feel free to get in contact with me. I believe we will be able to find a solution to that. Uh, so uh, you should not uh, worry uh, about uh, anything. Just don't be shy. Just contact uh, me and my colleagues, of course, and we will be very happy uh, to assist you with uh, whatever uh, you would like to address. Um, typically, after the uh, introduction of the tutor, uh, will take place the introduction of the students. Uh, but because of the online nature, uh, let's uh, skip that for now. Um, and of course, you know, to save some time uh, for this uh, lecture as well. 
Um, I hope you will have the opportunity to meet each other if you have not uh, already. Uh, perhaps in the next semester, if uh, everything goes well and we are allowed to go back uh, to the campus, or in this semester, if you uh, do some uh, labs as well. Uh, so let me start with some uh, information uh, about the module. Uh, well, you can see the module code and the title. Oh, no, the title is incorrect. I will uh, fix that <laughs> anyway. Um, well, it doesn't have a long session. It is practically two sessions. So uh, in two hours time or a bit less than two hours, we will be having a break. Uh, it makes sense that it is uh, quite tiresome both for myself and for you, of course, uh, uh, to have a long four hour uh, session. Um, if uh, we see that uh, this becomes uh, even more difficult, perhaps uh, next week we could uh, schedule two breaks instead of one. Uh, we'll see how it uh, goes and uh, I would like to have your feedback on that as well. Uh, but for now, uh, we'll have a break uh, around 11 a.m. Uh, for about 10 minutes. Um, well, you can definitely read the module names uh, in the description as well, but um, in a nutshell, uh, what this module uh, aims to do is to actually uh, provide you some further uh, knowledge uh, in the field of uh, structural engineering and in the analysis of uh, structures. Um, so uh, by this point, uh, most uh, of you, uh, if not all of you, uh, have already had an introduction uh, in uh, structural analysis. So here we will uh, go a bit uh, uh, more in detail. And uh, in this module, uh, we will be uh, seeing how we can analyze almost any type of structure. Of course, uh, as always, uh, we will be making some um, assumptions. It makes sense uh, because we need to simplify uh, what happens in nature in order to be able to analyze that numerically. Uh, however, uh, as you will see, uh, by the end of this module, you will be able to analyze um, a broad uh, range of uh, buildings, uh, of actual buildings. So uh, these principles will be principles that you will be using uh, by the end of the whole course as well. Um, typically, the delivery takes place with face-to-face uh, -face, uh, lectures, but of course, uh, for this semester, they will have to be online. Uh, there are also some uh, in-class activities that are uh, scheduled, which once again will have to take place uh, online. Uh, there are some laboratory classes now, uh, unfortunately, due to the uh, COVID related restrictions, uh, the number of students that could be in the lab is uh, quite small, uh, which means that uh, we would have to spend a couple of weeks uh, for the same uh, labs. Um, so in order to avoid that, uh, make sure that uh, you will all uh, have um, what you need for these labs. Uh, what uh, will happen is that uh, I will be recording the labs and then I will share with you all the data. So you will be able to use uh, the data and of course uh, see the video recordings uh, in order to uh, prepare a report that you would uh, need to prepare. Uh, also, like all modules, this one um, has a provision for self-directed learning. I always point this out because uh, this is something that students tend to uh, either forget uh, or perhaps uh, ignore for a while. You see, self-directed learning is a, an amount of time that you need to spend uh, not only in order to practice on what we have uh, done in the lectures, but also to search for uh, more uh, information, uh, perhaps uh, do some search uh, on particular topics that uh, you will be instructed. Um, and this is uh, very uh, important to actually uh, use, to spend this time uh, for self-directed learning. Um, as you will uh, be moving on uh, with the course, uh, this will become uh, more and more important. And if you don't actually 
uh, spend time uh, for that, uh, you will see that uh, it will become difficult to catch up later on. Uh, so please make sure that uh, you, uh, well, by the end of each week, you have uh, spent enough time for self-directed learning as well as revisiting the lectures uh, that we will be having. Uh, the assessment of this uh, module uh, actually um, comprises two components. The first one is uh, a coursework, uh, a portfolio if you want, because actually this uh, one comprises two components as well. The first one would be an in-class test, so it would practically be uh, a test um, that uh, you would take uh, in the class. Uh, here, instead of uh, the test uh, for this semester, of course, you will be given a coursework and you will have limited time to work on that and submit it. Um, so it will probably be something that you need to submit uh, within a day. Uh, you won't be having uh, weeks to do that. Um, also, uh, you need to prepare a lab report. Now, uh, this lab report, as I said, will be based on the recordings that I will be sharing with you and the data that I will uh, also give you. Um, so, all of uh, these uh, are parts of uh, the first component. The first component is 40% of the total module marks. The second one would typically be an exam. Uh, it would typically be a closed book exam. But of course, it is infeasible this semester. Um, this means that um, once again, you will be given a coursework. So practically uh, a number of uh, tasks that you need uh, to complete and then submit it uh, on Canvas as well. Uh, for this one, you will definitely have more time than for the first in-class test. This one was supposed to be more brief than this one. Um, we will see that in more details in the future uh, lectures. Um, let me just uh, uh, point out that uh, not only the presentation, but also the lecture slides will be made available on uh, Canvas uh, by the end of this session. Uh, so you will be uh, able to download them and uh, use them uh, for your uh, own study. Uh, here you can see the learning, teaching and assessment schedule for this module. Uh, the first week, of course, was the previous week uh, that was a welcome week. I hope uh, it was uh, useful for you and uh, you learned or you were um, actually uh, shown a few uh, things that you will be using uh, in the program. Um, <clears throat> this week we will be doing an introduction to the module and um, we will be discussing um, how we analyze uh, statically determined structures. So. It will be practically a recap of things that uh, you have uh, seen already, as well as, as some uh, worked examples uh, on uh, statically determined structures. Uh, next week, we will uh, be focusing on uh, internal forces, and then uh, we'll see how to analyze various types of structures. So trusses, uh, three-pinned uh, arches, and of course, frames. Um, we will uh, also focus on um, uh, stress and strain in um, various uh, structures and uh, we'll see the uh, formulation in order to uh, calculate uh, all of these. Apart from that, uh, we will be also using some uh, software. Uh, there are a lot of uh, different software packages that uh, we're using in uh, practice, of course. Uh, for this module, we will uh, be using a software that um, you can use in order to analyze any type of uh, two-dimensional structure. So it could be a frame, a truss, uh, or a three-pinned arch, pretty much anything. Um, it's actually quite handy and it uh, can be used both for static and uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, of course, here we will be using that for static analysis. So in week eight, uh, we will see some more 
about this uh, piece of software, which is quite handy. Uh, and um, what is uh, interesting is that it is actually free. So uh, you don't even need your uh, student account to download that. You could uh, download that uh, on your personal PC and use it uh, even after your uh, studies as well. Um, in week nine, uh, we will be doing the laboratories once again, as I said, uh, using the video recordings that I will have uh, prepared uh, and shared with you by then. Um, then in weeks 10 and 11, uh, we will be discussing on the deflections of structures. Uh, one basic um, assumption that we make in order to analyze uh, structures, including in this module, um, is that the structures actually do not deform. They are rigid and non-deformable. However, in reality, we know that they do deform. So uh, we have improved our theory in order to be able to calculate uh, the deflections uh, or the uh, deformations, if you want, um, of these uh, structures. There are various methods to do so. We will see two methods that uh, we can use in order to calculate the deflections of beams. Um, and then in weeks 12 and 13, we will see how to analyze statically indeterminate structures. These are structures uh, where a, a large number of uh, supports uh, is um, being used in order to uh, make sure that they will be in equilibrium. Uh, but for these structures, the theory that uh, you have seen already and we will be revisiting um, does not apply, which means that we need to use a different method. Once again, for these types of structures, there are a few different methods. We will see one of them. Actually, this is the easiest one. Um, so uh, in this sense, you're certainly uh, quite lucky. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's a quite handy method, and it's actually a quite old method, as you will see, but people are using that uh, until uh, nowadays. Actually, a few software packages use this method or the other methods, depends, uh, in order to analyze um, structures. So this is uh, pretty much uh, all in a nutshell, of course. Um, here you can see some key resources uh, using your student account. Uh, if you visit the library website, you will be able to have access to most, if not all of them uh, online. So you should be able to read them as uh, ebooks. Um, I believe you will not be able to download them uh, for various reasons, of course, but uh, you will be able to read them online. Um, Nevertheless, I have made sure that in the lecture notes, you will have everything you need. So all of these are additional resources that it's quite good for you to use. Um, and of course, please uh, have a look and uh, use them as uh, much as possible as well for further reading, of course. Uh, before I move on uh, with uh, today's presentation, uh, is there any question up to this point? Uh, if there is something, please just uh, uh, write this down in the public chat and uh, I will be uh, answering. Uh -huh. Okay, I don't see anybody typing. Uh, I hope this is a good sign. So uh, let's move on with uh, today's uh, introduction to the uh, module. Um, at this point, I will just stop sharing my camera so that the presentation slide will be larger because typically uh, there is a window on the top of that. Uh, so I hope that now it uh, looks better. And uh, at some point when we will start uh, working on some examples, uh, I will just be sharing uh, a PowerPoint presentation instead of uh, that. It should not have any uh, 
difference uh, for you. So it should be exactly the same for you as well. Um, so, um, well, I believe I have uh, pretty much described all of that. So let's not uh, spend more time just going through the agenda. Uh, well, what is a structure? Now, as you can see in the broad sense, as a structure, any man-made uh, object could actually uh, qualify. So as you can see here, it's not only uh, buildings, but also it could be cars, uh, spacecrafts, uh, tables, uh, pretty much anything. Anything that uh, was uh, put in place uh, by humans uh, in order to serve some function. Now, in uh, structural engineering, when we refer to structures, uh, typically we refer to buildings uh, or, as you can see here, uh, any type of engineering projects uh, such as uh, tunnels, uh, dams, bridges, uh, um, water towers or anything else. Um, now, when we refer to a structure in structural engineering, uh, of course, it has to be something man-made. Uh, it is not uh, something uh, natural. Um, we would be using a different uh, term for that anyway. Um, it should, well, it should have a load-bearing uh, mechanism. So uh, there are various ways for structures to uh, receive the loads and transfer them safely to the ground. So uh, regardless the structural system of the structure, uh, it should have a way to transfer the loads safely, uh, to receive and transfer the loads safely. Um, we would expect that it's something big, heavy and expensive. Not necessarily, but uh, it's certainly not something quite small. Uh, we're talking about, uh, well, for the scale, you can imagine that uh, even a small uh, house uh, like a bungalow, it's certainly uh, much larger than a car or something even smaller. Uh, all structures are supposed to be permanent. They're not uh, temporary. Of course, using the principles that uh, we will be uh, dealing with in this module, you can analyze um, structures uh, that are temporary. Uh, however, here we mainly refer to permanent ones. Uh, and of course, it should not be moving. It should uh, be in static equilibrium. Uh, the purpose of the structures, well, the first uh, one was actually the one that uh, our uh, ancient ancestors uh, needed, protection. Uh, so the first uh, factor that um, led humans to actually construct something was to be protected uh, from the nature uh, or from uh, um, other uh, predatory animals and of course from other humans um, apart from that uh, nowadays uh, we use them in order to provide comfort uh, in order to actually provide us access it could be a bridge uh, or perhaps a road uh, on a, a mountain or a tunnel, uh, all of them provide access to various uh, locations. Um, it could be a structure that uh, is uh, mainly, uh, or perhaps uh, it could be its only purpose to actually provide some aesthetic, aesthetic um, uh, appeal, uh, meaning that it is something pleasing, uh, like a monument. Uh, not necessarily only that, because nowadays, especially very large buildings are built in order to uh, not only serve the purpose, for example, that could be residential or uh, office buildings, uh, but they are also designed in a way that uh, they can be aesthetically pleasing as well. Um, and of course, they need to be able to uh, ensure the safety of the users and everybody around them as well. Uh, here you can see some uh, different methods that we can use in order to construct pretty much the same thing. So here, for example, 
uh, we have a flat slab and you can see with the red arrows how the loads are transferred from the slab to the columns and then from the columns to the ground. Uh, here we have a one-way slab, so loads are transferred in one direction. Here we have a two-way slab, so loads can be transferred in two directions. So you can see that we have a lot of different methods in order to achieve the same uh, goal. Uh, of course, uh, each method is more cost efficient under different circumstances, which means that one of uh, the tasks uh, of a civil engineer is to actually uh, know how to select the most cost efficient method uh, and, of course, design it appropriately. Uh, a type of structures, well, this is actually probably the one of the first types of structures uh, ever used. Uh, well, it is the beams. Beams are linear elements. And when I'm talking about linear elements, uh, a linear element is an element that, uh, well, everything is three dimensional, but in these elements, one of the dimensions should be much larger than the other two. So, for example, in the figure over here, the span of this beam, or the length, if you will, is much larger than the other two dimensions, the height and the breadth of the cross section of it. Uh, and this is why uh, we are able to simulate this structure with just a line uh, on a plane. So, for example, here, this would be a frame that we would use to simulate, for example, a building. Uh, as you can see, it consists of linear elements as well. Uh, the beams uh, typically carry loads which are perpendicular to their large dimension, the larger one, uh, and they can resist any kind of uh, deformation by developing shear forces and bending moments along their length. Uh, hmm. I don't see columns over here. Well, uh, a similar element is the column, but the main difference is that the column uh, typically receives loads parallel to the large dimension over here. So columns are typically uh, found to be in compression. Uh, of course, it can receive bending moments and shears as well when uh, it comes to lateral loads on the structure. However, uh, the major uh, stress comes from uh, axial compression in columns. Yeah, that's the main difference between columns and beams. Uh, of course, we can have more complex structures that comprise more than uh, one or even two uh, members. Uh, we can have trusses. Now, trusses uh, are structures that uh, consist of bars. Bars are elements that receive only axial loads. Uh, so the end conditions of these elements are such that uh, they do not receive any moments or shear forces. Uh, something that is very uh, important when it comes to trusses is that the loads should apply uh, on the joints of the trusses, not on the members. If the load applies on the member, then it will not perform as a bar, but as a different type of structure, perhaps as a beam. Uh, we also have moment resisting frames. You can also find them in literature simply as moment frames. Um, and these are frames that consist of uh, typically columns and beams. Uh, you can see typical uh, uh, types of uh, frames um, over here. And of course, you don't have to have a very simple type of frame. It can be a more complex one. Now, uh, as I said, in this module, we will see how to analyze these structures as well using the theory that you have seen already for statically determined structures, 
for example, these traps over here, uh, you wouldn't be able to analyze them. But now we will see the method, uh, which, as I said, is quite simple as well. Uh, we also have arches. Arches have been used uh, since uh, ancient times um, because they are uh, using their geometry in order to transfer the loads. Now, they receive typically gravitational loads um, and the internal forces that develop are predominantly compressive. Even though, of course, they develop uh, shear and bending moment, uh, the compression is uh, much more significant than the other two. Uh, we have cables. Cables are actually uh, a very interesting type of uh, structural element. And the main reason for that is that cables can only develop tensile stresses. So if there is tension in a cable, then it is able to uh, withstand it. If there is compression, it will be deforming. Uh, even though when you first hear that, it might seem as a shortcoming of this type. Uh, in reality, uh, this property is very, very useful uh, and uh, it has a lot of applications. Uh, personally, I have been using cables in my research uh, in order to retrofit structures uh, and the performance is much, much better than other um, type of uh, retrofit methods that uh, others have used in the past, uh, which is also uh, something good, but I'm sure that you have already seen uh, various types of very large structures that use cables. For example, uh, you can see here uh, at the bottom we have cable state bridges, or here at the top we have cable suspended bridges. Uh, do you know the difference between cable state and cable suspended bridges? Uh, and if you do, please uh, type that in the public chat. OK, I don't see anybody typing. Uh, no worries. So the main difference between cable state and cable suspended is that in a uh, cable state bridges, the cables receive the load from the deck of the bridge and transfer them to the uh, towers, the piers, if you want, um, directly. In cable suspended bridges, there is a main cable and there are secondary cables, which are called hangers, and then the loads transfer from the deck through the hangers to the main cable, and from the main cable, uh to the uh towers the, uh, and the ground as well so the main difference is that cable suspended bridges have this main cable that uh, runs uh, along them uh, both of them are have uh, uh, of course um, pros and cons and that's why uh, they're both used in practice Uh, we also have two and three dimensional elements, and at this point, let me move on to share this presentation, which is the same presentation, actually. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is uh, because I want to also save all the notes and then share them with you as well. Um, <clears throat> so, as you can see over here, we can have cells, uh, floors, slabs, stamps, etc. Now, all two-dimensional elements, well, they can have any type of shape. For example, something like that. But depending on how they receive loads, they can have a different designation. And the reason is that they are analyzed differently. So, for example, if we have a two-dimensional flat element that receives loads perpendicular to um, 
it's um, well or perhaps if you want parallel to its short dimension um, then this is a slab on the other hand if it receives loads parallel to one or both of its large dimensions this is not a slab this is a plate uh, these two elements are designed differently uh, and they are analyzed differently as well um, well it is the main theory but with different assumptions of course we can have cells and cells are typically curved structures in two dimensions for example it could be something like that let's say part of a dome or perhaps well it could be pretty much anything in reality this would be a cell uh, and of course we can have or for example uh, some kind of retaining walls Now, retaining walls will be receiving loads like that. So, uh, as you might imagine, retaining walls will be analyzed and designed as slabs. um and let's go to uh, the types of supports that are uh, used well we have three types of uh, supports uh we have roller supports um, which prevent the uh, translation in one direction we have pin supports that allow rotation but prevent any translation uh, movement and we have fixed supports that prevent any rotation or translation. Uh, these are the main types of supports. There are other types of supports also uh, used. Um, however, in this module, we will be using only these three types. Uh, um, for example, you can see here what a roller support uh, looks like in practice. Uh, for example, this could be uh, a bearing uh, on a deck <clears throat> now the well there is a common misconception when it comes to uh, roller supports because you can find that in literature that a roller provides a vertical component uh, well, this is not true. Uh, in reality, the roller provides a reaction in the direction that uh, it uh, points to. So, if the roller uh, points uh, upwards, then the uh, reaction will be upwards as well. If it points uh, in an inclined uh, well in some angle then the reaction will be in this uh, angle as well um, <clears throat> here you can see a pin support pin supports are uh, also uh, used um, and they're used a lot um, it is easy to design them in steel structures it is not that easy to design them in uh, concrete structures but of course it's not infeasible um, and of course we have fixed supports so fixed support as i said is something that prevents any type of rotation and this is why uh, bending moment also uh, develops uh, in them as a reaction to this uh, to any actions Now, if we go to structural systems, uh, we can have pretty much anything that you can imagine could be constructed. Uh, almost anything, not everything. 
uh, most of them are just uh, a matter of cost. Uh, nevertheless, when it comes to modeling, here uh, we can see a cantilever, um, sorry, this one is a simply supported beam, um, which has a pinned uh, support and a roller. We can have cantilevered beams or fully fixed beams, or we can have statically indeterminate structures such as uh, this one over here. Now, uh, the loads that uh, act on uh, our structures are modeled as well um, in different ways. Uh, we have point loads or concentrated moments, and these are loads that apply on a very small uh, area on the structure and this is why we simulate them with uh, a point load or perhaps with a concentrated moment of course we can have loads that apply uh, in a much wider area and this is why we need to model them as distributed loads for example the self weight of a structure it is certainly a distributed load uh, or perhaps uh, let's say the hydrostatic pressure on a tank it is certainly a distributed load um, and more as well um, when it comes to uniformly distributed loads loads that are distributed all over the length of an uh, element or as i said at least in a quite wide uh, uh, area uh, what we do is to calculate uh, what we call the resultant force for this uh, load. This is a point load that will have the same effect uh, on the structure, well, not the whole structure, but it will have the same effect on the structure for the purposes of our modeling. Um, and here you can see that this load will actually have the same magnitude as if we would calculate the total load of this uniform distributed load. So here, the magnitude is Q. Uh, it applies on a span uh, equal to L. So the resultant force will be Q times L. <clears throat> Apart from those loads, uh, we can also have uh, thermal loads. Uh, they don't have to be due to fire or uh, uh, freezing. Uh, it could just be due to uh, differences in the temperature. For example, uh, during winter, the temperature outside uh, could be uh, quite low, while inside the building, it will be uh, at least uh, 10 or 20 degrees, perhaps uh, above that. Uh, this creates uh, different rates of deformation on the two surfaces of the element, which also creates internal forces in the element. And these internal forces are a result of these thermal loads. Uh, also loads um, on structures apply due to support element. We might call them loads, but actually uh, what we see is the effect of that. So for example, due to the support settlement, if a support uh, actually uh, settles a bit, um, it will cause deformation. And because of this deformation, we will also have uh, internal forces. So it is as if loads would apply on structures. Uh, some more basics uh, on uh, statics and of course, in engineering in general. Uh, here you can see how you can convert units. Uh, here you have all of the prefixes, well, the most uh, prevalent uh, ones used. There are others as well. Um, so if you have a unit and uh, you need to be using something that is 1000 times more than that, you just need to use the prefix kilo, or if it's 1000 times, it's the prefix mega and so on. Um, 
Now, make sure that you are familiar with these prefixes because it is something that you need to know in order to be able to uh, deal with uh, units uh, in general. Um, not only when it comes to exercises here, but also when it comes to uh, practice. Um, I have uh, specialized in uh, steel structures and, uh, well, when uh, I would um, get some uh, section tables from manufacturers, uh, well, all of them would be using different units. They would be using pretty much anything they would imagine. Even though there is supposed to be some kind of uh, standardization, still uh, others would give uh, dimensions, for example, section dimensions in decimeters, others in millimeters, uh, others in centimeters. They would do pretty much anything. Uh, <laughs> so it was up to me to actually, uh, of course, understand these uh, tables uh, and, of course, convert the units in order to do my calculations. Um, and this is just a simple example of uh, why this is uh, needed. Nevertheless, in this module, you will need them as well, uh, because um, even though any types of units might be given, uh, typically the answers should be in specific uh, units. Uh, here is a handy way to actually convert the units. So, for example, if you want to convert a kilogram, let's say, to milligrams, what you do is to just add one over here and then start adding zeros as you go back. And this is the number by which you need to multiply what you have over here. Uh, it goes the other way around if you want to convert, let's say, milligrams to kilograms. So you put one over here and then zeros until you reach there. Of course, uh, there needs to be a decimal separator as well, but uh, that would be pretty much all and it is quite handy. Um, and with all of that, let's go to the uh, structural modeling. Actually, before we go over there, is there any question up to this point? Okay, I don't see anybody typing, so I assume there is no question. Uh, can you hear me well? Uh, how is the sound? Okay, that's good to know that. Um, perfect, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, let's see how we uh, actually analyze our structures. Uh, as you already know and you have heard, but we will be seeing. Uh, what we do is to simplify uh, what happens in reality uh, in order to meet what we know and the methods that we have available. So, for example, over here, you can see a roof trash on a, a structure. For example, it could be an industrial building. Um, so, in order to model this roof trash, uh, what we do is to simulate its elements with bars. Uh, we also simulate the connections between the elements with hinges. And this is what we get in order to analyze our structure. We know that, of course, in reality, it's a bit different. However, uh, the results that we get from our analysis are quite useful and together with some adjustments that we will be making when it comes to design, um, they can be used in order to select the sections of the structures and uh, the construction method and pretty much anything else that uh, we might need. Here you can see another type of uh, idealization uh, or modeling, if you want. Uh, we have a beam and then we have Perhaps it, this could be any kind of container, perhaps a tank that uh, is, uh, well, on the beam. Um, however, two uh, steel sections are used uh, in order to transfer the loads. And this means that all the load from the container 
um, will be transferred through these two sections. In other words, the whole load will be concentrated uh, in these two points. And this is why we would model that with two point loads. What I want you to keep in mind, of course, is that it is up to you to select the most appropriate modeling uh, for the analysis. Another type of uh, idealization, here you can see various types of uh, steel connections. Uh, all of these connections are supposed to restrict any rotation and, of course, the movement of uh, one component uh, um, in relation to the other. Uh, so all of these are modeled assuming that we have rigid connections. And we will see how this is uh, analyzed, of course, in this module. Um, the same type of connections are um, realized and, of course, uh, modeled in uh, concrete structures as well. Uh, in reality, in concrete structures, this is uh, one of the predominant type of connections that we have between elements. Uh, it is not easy to construct, uh, for example, a pin support. But of course, it's not impossible. Uh, it can be done if uh, needed. <clears throat> um, a main uh, property of these rigid connections is that the elements deform, uh, well, not necessarily in the same rate, uh, but um, they deform together. This means that we uh, assume that the connection does not deform at all. So, for example, here that uh, it forms a right angle, it should remain a right angle. But of course, they will deflect, for example, if you have a load, a perpendicular load over here. Uh, so, if the load applies like that, this is the type of deformation that you would expect to see. Um, so, using this uh, modeling, we can model uh, much larger structures, for example, these uh, frames, these space frames that you see over here. Uh, we can model them with these plane frames, provided, of course, that the conditions uh, allow that. Um, Of course, as I said, there are other types of connections uh, that allow uh, an amount of rotation uh, to develop. And because they allow rotation, they are modeled using hinges instead of a rigid uh, support or rigid connection. Uh, they are mainly used in uh, steel structures, as you can see over here. Uh, however, they can be realized in concrete structures as well. It is possible to do that. Uh, for example, you can see here a beam uh, on a column or perhaps uh, two slabs connected together. It is also possible to connect it at a column base uh, to design and construct uh, a pinned support at a column base. Um, as I said, it is not something that we prefer um, because it is easy to get um, a large number of cracks near this surface, um, which also has uh, additional uh, issues. However, uh, it is possible to do so uh, if the design shows that this is the most cost efficient uh, solution. <clears throat> now, as you can see over here, a hinge connection, um, it does not force the elements to uh, deform concurrently. So this could deform like that, but perhaps this column would not deform at all. It doesn't have to deform like that. It would deform like that if there was another force applying over here. Of course, in reality, if we had, let's say, a very strong beam and a very weak column, we would model it as a hinge, as you can see over here, but we would know that, yes, 
the formation of the beam will also cause some kind of deformation of the column. So once again, it is uh, the civil engineer's uh, job to actually know how to do that and uh, how to do that more efficiently. Another type of uh, structural idealization, a more detailed one, is what we call the finite element modeling and the finite element analysis. Here uh, we uh, design three-dimensional structures. You can see how much uh, the model over here looks like uh, the reality. Um, but then we divide that into small three-dimensional elements and then we define the conditions um, that apply between these elements, how these elements connect to each other, um, and also uh, how they would perform under loading. Um, so when it comes to analysis, this type of uh, analysis is certainly um, much more efficient than the modeling that we will be doing in this uh, module. Uh, of course, it requires a lot more uh, computational effort and keep in mind that it is quite difficult to do that by hand. So if you wanted to perform an analysis on that by hand, it would probably take a few years, while in a computer it will just take a few seconds. So you will be uh, doing finite element analysis but of course with the aid of uh, computers or perhaps some powerful workstations. Um, here you can see how uh, an experimental procedure is modeled using finite element analysis. Also, what is very interesting is that, as you can see here, this is the model and this is the failure that is predicted by the model. So you can see some buckling uh, the flanges here and here, and you can see the, the same type of failure in the experiment as well. Uh, so uh, keep in mind that finite element uh, analysis is uh, a quite accurate method. It's, it is certainly the most accurate method we have available nowadays. Uh, and in sometimes the results yielded by finite element analysis are considered to be comparable or perhaps even equivalent to experimental results, uh, of course, depending on the type of experiment. Um, let's move on to more uh, basics on uh, statics. Well, what applies on statics is certainly uh, all of uh, Newton's laws. Um, so, of course, if the resultant uh, force acting on a particle or perhaps on a structure in our case uh, is zero, then it should be in equilibrium. Actually, what we are doing here is to assume that our structure is in equilibrium, which implies that all resultant forces and moments on this structure have to be equal to zero. Um, of course, in statics, uh, you won't have any acceleration, uh, which could be the second, actually the third law of uh, the third of Newton's law. Anyway, um, well, let's not dwell on that. Um, when it comes to forces, we use vectors in order to model them. Um, of course, when it comes to vectors, uh, it is possible to combine them uh, together. For example, here you can see that we have two forces. Uh, we have F1 and F2. F1 goes from O to A, F2 from O to B. Now, if these forces are concurrent, meaning that they apply at the same point, then the resultant force can be uh, calculated either graphically or using uh, trigonometry. Any option is uh, acceptable, of course. Uh, we can also go the other way around. So if we have a force uh, in an angle, for example, this R in an angle theta, 
as you can see over here. Um, it might be more convenient and it will be more convenient for us to analyze this force in two perpendicular components. Uh, we prefer perpendicular components uh, because it is easier to apply uh, the equations of equilibrium that uh, we will be mentioning and using, of course, uh, later on. Um, once again, to analyze this force, you can use trigonometry or you could do that graphically as well. In this module, we will be mainly uh, doing things um, um, using trigonometry, but not only that. Um, now, when it comes to equilibrium, uh, well, if you have a number of forces applying at the same point, and that's why we call them, as I said, concurrent forces, um, it is possible to calculate the force, another force, a fictitious one, if you want, that should apply at the same point uh, in order to make sure that this uh, particle or perhaps a structure uh, would be in equilibrium. Now we're talking about uh, particles because we don't have any dimensions over here. To calculate this force uh, that would make sure that this is in equilibrium, uh, you need to calculate the resultant force and then draw a force with the same magnitude but the opposite direction. Uh, this force is called the equilibrant. Um, it is possible to do that for any amount of forces applying at a point. Uh, you don't necessarily need to do that for only two. Um, a method that we often use uh, you can do that graphically uh, if you want, um, is uh, this method over here. Uh, what we do is to construct a polygon which comprises all of these forces. You can start with any of these forces, the selection is arbitrary, and then start adding forces on that as well. Once again, the order doesn't really matter. So. Uh, regardless of the order in which you will be adding the forces, uh, the results should be the same. The only principle is that the start point of one force has to be the end point of the previous one that you have drawn. If you do so, uh, for example, here you can see F1, F2, F3 and F4. So this one, RE, is the equilibrant. Uh, if you would start from point O and end at point E, you would get the resultant. This is the method that you would use for resultant. If you try to close this shape, you will get the equilibrant force. Of course, everything that we saw uh, up to this point has to do with uh, points in space, which means that uh, they have no dimensions. However, structures do have dimensions. Uh, so when you have a force on the structure, you will also have a moment developing on that as well. Uh, of course, if the force applies on the point, then uh, the moment will be zero. But if there is a distance between the force, a perpendicular distance between the force and the given point, then there will be a moment. The moment of force F over here, M will be F times the perpendicular distance A. Uh, moments uh, have also vectors as well. So even though we are used to uh, draw moments like that, we need to keep in mind that moments have vectors. And because uh, they are vectors, actually, 
uh, it is possible to use all the mathematics we know for vectors uh, in moments as well. So, in order to uh, define the vector of the moment, what we need to do is to apply uh, the rule of the right hand uh, thumb. <clears throat> Actually, let me show you what this means. Uh, I believe you have seen that already, but uh, it's not that bad an idea to actually uh, do that again. Um, let me share my camera. Uh, can you see me? Yes? Okay, that's good. So let, let's assume that this ruler over here is a cantilever beam. And a force, well, my hand, this hand of mine is actually the support. So this is a fixed support. And then we have a force applying perpendicularly over here. Now, this force tends to rotate this cantilever beam about this point, about the support. Because it tends to rotate that, we have a moment that goes like that. Now, if you use your right hand and you try to uh, simulate the moment, the thumb of your hand will show you the direction of the uh, vector of the moment. So in this case, if the moment is like that because this force points downwards, then the moment should be perpendicular and in this case uh, moving towards the screen or the camera. Um, you can uh, try and do that on your own uh, if you want. This is a quite handy rule. Uh, it always applies on moments, but please keep in mind that you have to use your right hand. Uh, in the past I've had a few questions uh, of students saying that, yeah, but it seems to be pointing the other way around. Yeah, which hand did you use? Yeah, this one. Yeah, but you should be using the right one. So, yeah, uh, it's a quite handy rule, uh, but it should be uh, applied uh, appropriately. Uh, I hope it was helpful, but let's not uh, dwell on that. Um, and let's move on. As I said, because we are using, uh, well, because moments have vectors, um, it is possible to combine moments uh, as if they were forces as well. Um, here in this uh, slide, you see what I tried to show you uh, on uh, the video screen as well. Um, in the first case, the first case is what I tried to show you. So the vector of the moment would be in uh, this, well, sorry, it would be in the other direction. Uh, let me do it like that. Uh, typically for moments, we use two arrowheads over here uh, in order to distinguish between forces and moments. Uh, now, if the moment was uh, something like that, so it was about the axis that is parallel uh, to the uh, beam, then the vector of the moment would be looking like that. In this case, it would cause twisting, or uh, the term we use in engineering is torsion on the beam. Uh, torsion certainly has different effect on a beam uh, than bending moment. As I mentioned earlier, because moments are vectors, they can be combined um, with the same 
exactly the same principles. Uh, something else that is uh, quite interesting is uh, the force couple. Uh, a force couple uh, are two forces that have the same magnitude, but the opposite direction, as you can see over here. Um, also, apart from that, uh, these two forces should not be concurrent. This means that these two forces should not apply uh, at the same point. Now, if there is a distance between these two forces, what happens is that the resultant of these two forces will be a moment. And this is because the forces cancel each other out. However, if you try to calculate the moment about any point, not only between the forces, but even outside the forces, the moment will be the magnitude of the force times the distance. So here, this force couple will create this moment M that, as you can read over here, is F times D. Um. <clears throat> now, uh, when we, what is going on with that? Sorry. Just give me a second. Um, just give me a moment. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation, the PowerPoint presentation here, instead of the one in big blue button? I I believe so. Okay. Uh, all right. So um, when you have a number of forces, in order to calculate the resultant of these forces, um, if they are parallel. It's uh, not that difficult. What you need to do is to calculate the moment of all of these forces about the same point. You can select any point arbitrarily. Typically, we select one, uh, well, a point in uh, the direction of at least one of uh, these um, forces so that its moment will be zero. Um, but as I said, you can select pretty much anything. And then the magnitude is the algebraic uh, uh, sum of these forces. So you just add them together, and this is the magnitude. Uh, uh, you also need to calculate the distance at which this force should apply from the given point. Uh, so that the moment of this resultant force will be equal to the moment of all of these forces. So these two conditions should apply. The moment should be equal and the sum should be equal to the algebraic uh, sum of the forces. And with that, let's see an example of uh, what we have already said. Over here, you see a number of forces. We have a 2 kN force pointing downwards, a 3 kN force pointing upwards, uh, a 6 kN force 
pointing downwards and the one kilonewton force pointing downwards as well. Uh, you can also see the distance between uh, all of these uh, forces. Now, uh, what we are asked to do over here is to calculate the resultant of these forces. So, what we will be doing is to start calculating the moments of the moment of these uh, forces by a point, let's say a point over here. Let's call it point A. <clears throat> now, the moments, the sum of moments about point A will be, well, the moment of this force, because this force passes from point A, so it has no perpendicular distance, it will be two times zero, so it is zero. It can just be neglected. The moment of this force will be three kilonewtons times the distance that is 0 0.6 meters. Now here, because at least one of them has a different direction, we have to define the positive and the negative uh, direction of the forces uh, and of course of the moments. So one might say, well, you know what, I can see, for example, that uh, the number of uh, forces pointing downwards is larger than the number of forces pointing upwards. So I expect the resultant to point downwards as well, which means that I will assume that any force pointing downwards will be positive. Also, I see at least two forces that tend to rotate the system clockwise. So I can assume that the moments which are clockwise are positive as well. So if we make this assumption, the moment of this three kilonewton force over here is actually a counterclockwise moment. It tends to rotate it uh, opposite to the direction of the uh, clock. So it should get a negative sign, minus three kilonewtons times 0 0.6 meters. And then we need to add the moment by this force. So it is a clockwise moment about point A. So plus six kilonewtons times 0 0.6 plus 0 0.3 this is 0 0.9 meters, plus this moment over here from the one kilonewton force, it is a clockwise moment, so one kilonewton times 0 0.6 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.3, 1.2 meters. And this gives us a sum of um let's actually calculate that this is four point eight kilonewton meters or kilonewtometers if you want. Um, the fact that this has a positive sign means that this will be a clockwise moment. Now we know that the resultant must have the same magnitude as the sum of all forces. So since we said that the ones pointing downwards are positive, the resultant must be 2 minus 3 plus 6 plus 
one, this is six kilonewtons. So we know that the moment due to force R, due to the resultant force, has to be equal to the sum of moments about point A. In other words, R times the distance, which now is X, as you can see over here, has to be equal to the sum of moments about point A. Or X has to be equal to the sum of moments about point A over R. And this is 4.8 kilonewton meters over 6 kilonewtons, which gives us a distance of 0 0.8 meters from point A. So this way, we have calculated the magnitude of the resultant force, which is 6 kilonewtons, and the position of this force, the distance of this force from point A, which is 0 0.8 meters. Uh, is there any question on this example, or perhaps on everything we said so far? Okay, even if it is a no, please just type it so that I know that uh, everything is uh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. So let's move on. Uh, well, when it comes to equilibrium, uh, it depends on whether we have structures in two or three dimensions. Of course, for a structure to be in equilibrium, the sum of all forces and the sum of all moments has to be equal to zero. So the sum of forces in any direction has to be equal to zero. And the sum of moments, once again, in any direction, has to be equal to zero. Um, when we have a plane frame or a plane structure, if you want, uh, this means that we have two axes. So in this case, the sum of forces in x direction and in y direction has to be equal to zero. Also, the sum of moments has to be equal to zero. Actually, uh, I think it's on the next slide. Yes. So, as you can see over here, the sum of forces in x direction must be equal to zero. The sum of forces in y direction must be equal to zero. Also, the sum of moments about axis z. Uh, when we write down these equations, we typically uh, do not write z. It's not incorrect, of course. If you want to write it like that, it will still be uh, fine. We just uh, skip it. Um, because we assume that we have a plane structure, so it's as if we have no z-axis. Um, of course, if we had the three-dimensional structure, then we would have three sum of forces in x, y, and z directions, but also three sum of moments about the x, about the y, and about the z-axis. So all of these conditions should apply for this uh, structure to be in equilibrium. Uh, in this module, we will not deal with three-dimensional structures. Um, we will only deal with uh, plane structures, two-dimensional ones. Um, but as you can see, it's exactly the same principles. So as I said, the same principles could apply on them. Um, but of course, we have time restrictions, so we cannot cover everything. Um, let's move on with this uh, recap. So uh, what is static determinacy? Now, when we have any structure, uh, depending on the amount of supports, 
it might or might not be possible to calculate the support reactions. And we need to calculate the support reactions in order to be able to calculate the internal forces after that. So, for example, if you have, let's say, a beam over here, which has a pinned support and a roller, this is also what we call a simply supported beam, then this would mean that we have these reactions over here. And at the same time, we have three equations that should apply so that it remains in equilibrium. The sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. The sum of forces in y direction has to be equal to zero. And of course, the sum of moments about any point should be equal to zero. So we have three equations and we have three unknown forces. This means that it is possible to solve this uh, system of equations. So it is mathematically possible to get a result for the forces. Um, so in this case, over here, we have a statically determinate structure. The unknown reactions. Uh, please keep in mind that there are a few exceptions. Actually, I can think of one uh, now uh, where you might have three unknown reactions, but it will still be statically indeterminate. Uh, but don't worry, we will not be dealing uh, with the exceptions. We will be showing them, but not uh, dealing with them uh, uh, when it comes to uh, tests or exams. Uh, now, if we had another beam, let's say this one over here. But then we had different types of supports. Let's say we have a fixed support over here. And perhaps a pinned support over here as well. This means that we will have a horizontal reaction, a vertical reaction, a moment, all of these three due to the fixed support, but we will also have a vertical and a horizontal reaction over here as well. Once again, the equations of equilibrium are the same because we have a plane structure. So it is a two dimensional structure. These three conditions need to apply. However, here we have fine, uh, sorry, five unknown uh, reactions. This means that because of that, it is not possible to actually uh, calculate the support reactions. I might be able to calculate some of them, but not all of them. So this is what we call a statically indeterminate structure. In this module, we will see how to calculate all of them uh, using one of the methods that are available. Uh, in this case, the moment distribution method that I referred to earlier. Uh, as you can see over here, I haven't drawn any load at all because whether or not a structure is statically determinate, it depends on the support conditions only and not on the loads that apply on the structure. In very few cases, in few exceptions, we might be able to do some simplifications and then uh, model a statically indeterminate structure as if it was statically determinate, but it's not usually the case. Typically, if it is statically indeterminate, this is all. Let's see an example of a statically determinate structure over here. Uh, in this example, uh, we are asked to calculate the support reactions for this simply supported beam. 
Now, here, for this beam, um, we see that we have a pinned support, which means that we will have a vertical, oh, okay, you can see the, the vertical component over here, uh, but that's okay, let me just throw this over here myself as well. Let's say R A vertical, let's use the same notation and R A horizontal. We also have a vertical component due to the roller. Once again, I need to highlight that the reaction of the roller is parallel to the direction of the roller, not necessarily vertical. It happens to be vertical over here, but it doesn't have to be that. So we have three unknown reactions and we have three equations of equilibrium. So it is possible to calculate uh, that. Uh, however, before we do that, we can see that we have an inclined force, which means that in order to have only forces in x or y directions, we need to do a force resolution. We need to analyze this force into two perpendicular components, a horizontal and the vertical one. So the analysis of this force can be done geometrically if you want. As you can see over here, we have a right angled triangle. This side is five kilonewtons. So if this is Fy and this is Fx, we know this angle over here, this one, it's 60 degrees. So if we use trigonometry, the sine of 60 degrees is Fy over 5 kilonewtons or Fy is 5 kilonewtons times the sine of 60 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so the horizontal component uh, will be, well, the sine of 60 degrees is uh, one, 0 0.5, so the horizontal component will be 2.5 kilonewtons. Let me just separate that. If we use the cosine of 60 degrees, this would be Fx, Fx over 5 kilonewtons, or Fx will be 5 kilonewtons times the cosine of 60 degrees, or Fx uh, will be, let's calculate that, Oh. I'm sorry, this one will be 4.3. Yeah, apologize for that. The cosine is 0 0.5, 4.3 kilonewtons. And this one will be 2.5 kilonewtons. So instead of this 5 kilonewton force, uh, we will have 2.5 over here and 
three kilonewtons over here. So now that all forces are either uh, horizontal or vertical, uh, it is possible to apply the equations of equilibrium. So actually, let me go to the next slide. The sum of forces in x direction has to be equal to zero. You can select uh, either the forces that point to the right or the forces that point to the left to be positive. Uh, it doesn't matter. No matter what uh, you will have selected, you should get exactly the same result. Let's assume that the ones that point to the right are positive. So we have R A H, the horizontal component of the reaction from the pin support at point A, minus this one that was the 2.5 kilonewtons. This one was 4.3. So minus 2.5. So the result is RAH equals 2.5. Uh, would that be correct? What do you think? Uh, no, uh, X is just uh, in order to show the uh, axis. It is not a force over there. It's the same with Y, Joe. So, uh, would this be correct over here? Would this result be correct? Yes, no, it's 50-50. What do you think? Yeah? Anybody else agrees? Yes, no, yes, okay. <laughs> All right, Samuel. Yep. Well, uh, let's not spend more time on that. It is partially correct. And I will explain why. Because, well, there's no mistake, uh, no numerical mistake. However, I have missed the units. I will keep saying that over and over and over again. Please do not forget the units. In all tests, there are marks allocated only for the units. Sometimes it might be half the marks. So you might even be using uh, losing half the marks if you forget to add the units. Uh, as I said, I have been teaching for the past uh, 11 years in higher education institutions. Every time there are students that no matter how much I keep repeating that, they forget the units. Please don't do so. I mean, it's, it's the, easy one, the easy way to uh, get some marks. Uh, and of course, the easy way to lose some marks. So units, units, units. I might become boring, uh, but I will uh, keep stressing this out. So um, if we use some forces here in y direction now, Let's assume that the forces that point upwards are positive, and this is because the two unknown forces point upwards. So we have RAV, the vertical component of the reaction of the pin support. We have the three kilonewton force, so minus three. We have the four point 33 component of the inclined force, so minus 4.33 because it points downwards, and Rd, so plus Rd, or Rdv actually, doesn't matter, uh, because it points upwards. All of them have to sum up to zero. In other words, Ra v plus rt minus 7.33 
or if I move it to the right side, it becomes a positive. This has to be 7.33. Don't forget the units. Now, at this point, you will see that we have two unknown variables, so we cannot solve further. So let's call it equation one, and we'll go back to that. If you go to the sum of moments about any point, uh, it should be equal to zero. Which point do you want me to calculate the moments about? It is first come, first served. Whatever you say, I will do that. Point A. Okay, Clive. Uh, so the sum of moments about point A has to be equal to zero. Actually, this is a very good selection. We typically select a point um, where at least one of the unknown variables of the unknown forces applies uh, on because um, this means that the moment of this force will be zero. Also, let's assume that the moments that are clockwise are positive. As I said, it doesn't matter. It could be the clockwise or the counterclockwise one. You should get exactly the same result. So the moment of RAH is zero because it has no perpendicular distance from point A. The moment of RAV is also zero because it applies at point A, so once again, it has no perpendicular distance. Now, this three kilonewton force has some perpendicular distance. It is actually 0 0.3 meters. Also, it tends to rotate the beam clockwise about point A, so it's a positive one. So this is three times 0 0.3. If we were using vectors here, we would start with a distance vector and then with the force vector. But for this module, it's fine to do that, to do uh, anything. So you can start with the forces. Um, we also have the 2.5 kilonewton force, which if you extend, you will see that it passes from point A. So once again, its moment is zero. However, we have the 4.33 kilonewton force, which tends to rotate it clockwise. So this is plus 4.33 kilonewtons times the distance, which is 0 0.3 plus 0 0.5, 0 0.8 meters. And then we have RD over here that tends to rotate it counterclockwise, which means that this is a negative moment, of course, with this assumption over here. And the distance is 0 0.8 plus 0 0.4, 1.2 meters. And all of them need to sum up to zero. So here we have only one unknown variable. This is RD. If we move it to the right side and then perhaps swap sides, we will get 1.2 times RD is, well, let me do this a bit more analytically. So three times 0 0.3 plus 4.33 times 0 0.8. or 1.2 times Rd is, let's see how much this is, 4.364 this is so R T has to be equal to 4.364 over 1.2, which is 3.64 kilonewtons. Now, 
as you will notice over here, I did not use any units while I was working out the uh, force. However, in the result, I did use the units. So it is fine if you don't use any units. There is no need for that. But make sure that you will be using them in your answers, in the results. Uh, if you don't, once again, you will be losing marks. So uh, without further ado, uh, from equation one, we know that R A V plus R D have to be equal to 7.33 or R A V plus 3.64 has to be equal to 7.33 or R A V has to be equal to 3 to minus 3, uh, sorry, 3.69 kilonewtons. Uh, so you can see that using the equations of equilibrium only, we were able to calculate the support reactions. Of course, these are the magnitude of the support reactions. Now, it happens here that the direction we picked for these reactions was actually the direction of the reactions. If the direction was the opposite one, we would just get a negative sign over here. It is still fine. Uh, you can either leave them as they are with a negative sign, or you can change the direction and also change the sign. It is up to you. Both approaches are correct, and both approaches are acceptable uh, in the case of an exam, for example. Uh, have you got any questions on this example and up to this point? Oh, um, um, let me see it live. Okay, can you see my pointer now? Great. Um, I believe you can now. Uh, so, yes, um, as I said, these um, forces over here point upwards and to the right. Uh, so, because the directions we selected uh, are the correct ones, they got a positive sign. If they had a negative sign, it would just imply that uh, they point to the other direction. So, for example, this one, if it, if it had a negative sign, it would be downwards. It would be fine to leave it as it is, with a negative sign. So, as an answer for a question in a test, uh, you could just leave it with a negative sign. Uh, if you would be using that to calculate, for example, the internal forces, it is up to you to leave it with this direction and the negative sign if you get a negative sign, or change the direction and change the sign too. Uh, what I suggest is to leave it as it is and keep the signs as well. Uh, otherwise, there is always a risk of confusion, and why take unnecessary risks? Uh, it is always better to avoid any risk, especially when it comes to tests and exams. Um, is there any question uh, on this example or on anything that we have seen so far? As I said, even if it's no, just say no so that I know that it's okay with you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I see a few knows. That's uh, good to see that. I hope things are quite straightforward. Uh, so at this point, we can have a break. Uh, let's say that it will be a 10 minute break. Uh, what I will also do is to actually end this meeting and add a new one so that there will be two sessions. Uh, just in order to make sure that the recording won't be very, very large and difficult to navigate through. So 
I will add a new conference and I will invite you all to the new conference as well. Um, Uh, yes, Clive. Uh, we can discuss any questions you might have uh, after the break if you want. So let me pause the recording. <laughs> 